Hello and welcome back to The Effect. Uh, we finally moved beyond our sort of like template design videos covering things like uh, the standard designs that you might expect to apply in a bunch of different scenarios. Except we sort of have and sort of have. We, we move past the chapters where we focus on a single one of those methods. Uh, and now we're going to just sort of give a big old rundown of a whole bunch of stuff that we have left out. And so there are a bunch of different causal inference methods, right? There's nothing, you know, completely uh, so unique about those ones that we've covered that they can't possibly ever be replicated. In fact, there are plenty of other methods that we did not cover. And some of them are more popular, some of them are less popular, some of them are newer, some of them are older, they're all different. Some of them overlap a little bit with the stuff we've already done. Some of them are relatively, uh, you know, completely different. Uh, so let's, in this video, I'm just going to give a brief overview of a few different methods uh, for doing causal inference, a few different research designs that we did not cover. So for all these, I'm not going to go super deep into the details. I'm just going to sort of tell you what they are. And then if you want more detail, you can look into the chapter, which also doesn't give you that much detail, but it does point you where to go if you do want the full technical rundown. So let's start with the closest thing that this book got to getting another chapter, which is synthetic control. So synthetic control is a fairly popular method that is used to look at the effect of a policy that goes into effect at a particular time. And that's something that you might have heard before, right? We've already done event studies where we are comparing uh, a, a group that got treated before they got treated to after. We also did difference in differences where we are similarly comparing a before to after difference, but between a group that got treated and a group that didn't. Now, synthetic control applies in a lot of very similar situations to where difference in difference might normally apply in that we need to have a group that was treated, uh, a before and after period, and we also need to have a set of control groups that they can be compared to. Now the main difference between difference in difference and uh, synthetic control is that synthetic control goes about its process of estimation very, very, very differently. So difference in difference, we are literally just comparing our before to after change between the treated group and the control group. What synthetic control does is it says, well, wait a minute, first of all, you know, how do we choose uh, of all the different control groups we could have? which ones make the most sense as a control group. So we are specifically here looking at situations where we have a number of different control groups, not just one. Additionally, synthetic control doesn't just say, hey, we're gonna make the comparison of before to after. We're gonna say, I'm going to choose a mix of the control groups. I'm going to take a bunch of different control groups and I'm gonna sort of mash them all together using a set of weights that we will estimate to create a single synthetic control group that we can compare to. Now, it, do, it picks the weights in a sort of deterministic way, a process that it can use to make the comparison as clean as possible. And it even uses the pre-treatment outcome variable as a matching variable. Uh, so when it does this, you end up sort of forcing prior trends to hold almost by design. If you look at a graph like this, that is an example of synthetic control, uh, you can see that in the before period, the treated group and the synthetic control group follow each other almost exactly. That's not in the data. That's not like we got lucky and that happened. It forced that to be the case. Then once we have those two before lines just smashed together, we might expect that, yeah, if we continued to look in the post-treatment period, they probably would have continued to stick together uh, even in the absence of treatment. And so if we compare what's happening to the synthetic control line and what is happening to the treated group, well, we can look at that and find our effect of treatment. In this example, we see that the treated line starts to dip below the synthetic control line relatively soon, suggesting that whatever this treatment is, it had a negative effect on the outcome. Now, this graph is actually a great example of synthetic control to talk to. It was one of the first uh, implementations of synthetic control ever back in 2003. And what it was is it was looking at the Basque region of Spain. And in particular, uh, there was a period of time uh, where there was a lot of additional violence going on in Spain due to sectarian differences. And uh, what they wanted to know is what was the effect of this violence on economic growth. And so they had the Basque region, and that was the treated group at a certain period that the violence started to occur in, in large amounts. And then the control groups, which were all the other different regions of Spain. Now you might think, well, some regions of Spain might be more or less comparable to the Basque region, and they agree. And so that's what the synthetic control method does. It takes all those other different regions of, of Spain, and it says, okay, based on their characteristics and also based on what their pre-treatment outcomes look like, I'm going to construct, construct a set of weights so that when you average together all those other regions of Spain, you get a line that looks pretty much just like the Basque region's line. And that's what we see in the pre-treatment period. Look how closely those lines go together. That's something the difference of difference could only dream of. Now, in this case, the uh, violence began in 1970, but it didn't really kick into gear for a few extra years, which is actually a nice little test of our method here, um, because we are using 1970 as our as our treatment period, uh, and we can see that the, uh, the lines continue to stick together for a few years before the violence really kicks into gear, which is great. That sort of suggests that, yeah, we pushed those lines together in the before period, 
And we're say, we're trying to make the claim that in the after period, they would have stayed together in the absence of treatment. And we still have a couple of additional years of not really being treated and they stick together anyway. That looks like it's working exactly as intended. Then they start to diverge. And that's the point at which we can say, oh yeah, it looks like the treatment that the violence that went into effect really did reduce economic growth in the Basque region. There's lots of cool stuff going on with, with synthetic control. You know, there's lots of cool ways you can check the plausibility of assumptions that are not really available in difference and differences. Uh, you can also use something called randomization inference to get your standard errors, which is kind of neat. And when you are in a situation where difference and differences might make sense, then yeah, it's something definitely worth looking into. As long as you have multiple different control groups that you can uh, synthetically control and push together, and also a lot of pre-treatment data. You do need a lot of pre-treatment periods to be able to make that match as clean as possible. But as long as those two things hold, then yeah, synthetic control might be something to look into. Next up is matrix completion coming from the world of machine learning. So matrix completion applies in cases where we have, you know, these, these binary treatments that either turn on or turn off for different people. So we have a panel data setting, just like we might with difference and differences once again. But in this case, the treatment can turn on or off at different points of time for different groups. It's all pretty flexible like that. Now, if we're interested in getting the treatment effect of the treatment, uh, we want to know what's the effect of being treated in a given period versus not being treated. Well, we have a problem, right? What, we, what do we inherently want to do? I want to say, I, I see that you're being treated right now. And I'm going to say I, the, the treatment effect for you is whatever's happening to you right now compared to, uh, you know, what it would have looked like for you if you hadn't gotten treated, right? I want to know that counterfactual, but I don't know. I can't observe that counterfactual. That's, the, that's what some people call the uh, fundamental problem of causal inference. So what matrix completion does is it says, hey, we got a lot of data. Why don't we just try to calculate what we think your counterfactual would have been? So it takes two matrices of data, one of just the outcome data uh, for people who are not currently being treated, the untreated matrix, and then one for the people who are currently being treated, the treated matrix. Now you notice a lot of question marks in these matrices. Those are the points where we did not observe somebody. So for example, individual two in time period one uh, has a question mark in the untreated matrix, but a zero in the treated matrix. What this is telling us is that person two, individual two, was treated in time period one. And so we don't know what their outcome would have been if they had been untreated. It's a question mark. So matrix completion just says, hey, let's fill in the question marks on the untreated matrix, and then we have something to compare our treated data to. And so it goes iteratively. It uses regularized regression, which is a machine learning tool, uh, to try to make those predictions. If it goes uh, first by looking at uh, time variable. So it says, okay, I'm, I'm trying to predict a value in time period one. So I'm going to use the other data that I have from time period one to try to predict what person two would have been if they had also been untreated at this time. Then it goes the other way. It says, okay, I'm looking at person two. I know a lot about individual two, uh, and I can try to predict what this question mark would be based on the fact that I know it's individual two, and I can see individual two in other periods as well. And it sort of goes back and forth with this, trying to make its best prediction that it can for what individual two would have seen if they had been untreated in time period one. And that's the basics of matrix completion. Next up is kind of a surprising one, which is causal discovery. Uh, so I've been talking this whole time about how your, your causal assumptions, your causal diagram that you're basing your research design off of should come from theory. There's not a whole lot that you can do to get data to make those assumptions for you or really even validate those assumptions. It's pretty rare that an assumption can actually be validated in the data if it is truly an assumption about something you can't observe. That's not always true. And that brings us to causal discovery. Causal discovery is the idea that you can write down a list of variables that you think are going to be relevant in your model and you can use data to test all the relationships between those variables. And in doing so, you can rule out certain causal relationships and therefore at least partially build the causal diagram from those sets of results. Let me give you an example of that. So let's say that we are in a setting where we think that there's four important variables, A, B, C, and D. And we're gonna start not knowing what any of the arrows are. So I'm just gonna put a blank, no headed arrow between all four of those variables. So it's gonna look like this. So I got four variables. I have no idea what does or does not affect anything. So let's start by investigating some of these arrows and see if we can get rid of some of them or perhaps put a direction on some of them. So let's say that we look in the data and we say that A and B are completely unrelated to each other. There's no relationship there whatsoever. Or perhaps that there is a relationship, but once we control for D, that relationship goes away. In either of those cases, we would say, well, there's not really going to be a direct arrow from A to B. If controlling for D makes the entire relationship go away, then that means that there's no direct relationship there. And so once we've done that, we could then delete the arrow between A and B, just get rid of it, cross it out. What else can we do? Well, we can use the idea of colliders to do a bit more work for us as well. So let's say we're still looking at this diagram right here, and we know that there's no arrow between A and B, but then let's try another conditional relationship. Let's try looking at the relationship between A and B while controlling for C. If suddenly that no relationship that we saw before turns into a positive relationship, or at least a non-zero relationship, 
What does that tell us? That tells us that C must be a collider between on the pathway between A and B. So we must have A causing C and also B causing C uh, because that, that's the only way in which controlling for C would create a relationship between A and B if there was not already one there. So just from those sets of relationships that I've already talked about, we can get to a diagram that looks more like this. Now, so far we haven't done all the work and it's possible we can't really even go any further. We might not be able to figure out the relationships between uh, D and the other variables, but we've done some good work here. We've at least figured out partially just using the data itself without doing any theorizing beyond be picking the list of variables, figured out some of the aspects of the diagram. Now this isn't a free lunch. Like, as I said, you're not gonna get all the way to the answer a lot of the time. And then also you need to have a definition of what it means to be unrelated. That's pretty, pretty important part here. And it's not exactly clear what that means. Like, is it statistically insignificant? I don't think that's a great way to go about it. But um, uh, you can do some cool stuff with this nonetheless. The last method that I'm going to briefly talk about is called double machine learning or double debiasing. And this is just another approach to controlling for variables. And we talked about two different ways of controlling for variables. We talked about regression, where we run a regression of one variable on another and add some controls. We talked about matching. We are picking a sample where the control variables have the same value in our treated and untreated groups after we do our matching procedure. Let's think back to our regression approach to controlling for a variable. Uh, so when we did a regression, we added a set of control variables, right? So how did I introduce it the first time that I introduced the idea of controlling for a variable looking for a conditional conditional mean? I said, what we're really doing here is we're taking our control variables and we are predicting the treatment variable as best we can. And then we are subtracting out our prediction. In the, and in so doing, we are removing the part of the XY relationship that is explained by our controls. Then we saw what we could predict of the outcome variable using our controls and subtracting that out as well. This procedure leads you to the exact same results as just running a regression with the controls in it if you're doing that prediction using regression. But we don't have to do that prediction using regression. And in fact, this is a predictive problem, which is something that machine learning is really, really good at. Machine learning has a bit of difficulty with causal inference. There are some ways you can use it, but it's hard. Um, but prediction is really good at. And so if we can separate out the part of the causal inference process that is a prediction problem, we can give that prediction problem to machine learning and it will do a very good job of doing the prediction. So that's what double machine learning is all about. We are just taking our control variables and we are predicting our treatment as best we can and subtracting that prediction out. And we're taking those same control variables and predicting our outcome the best we can and subtracting those predictions out. The only difference from regression is that we are doing that prediction using some sort of machine learning algorithm, using lasso, using random forest. Maybe you could use a neural network. I don't think I've ever seen that one, but you could, right? That's the only difference. You're just using a different predictive procedure to do the prediction and subtraction process. And that's it. And you can do some cool stuff like controlling for a lot of different control variables all at once, or just fitting a non-linear functional form really, really well. All right, that is a brief overview of four different approaches that you can take to causal inference that we have not yet covered. Uh, there's certainly a lot more out there that you can explore, um, but uh, don't limit yourself just to these stock designs just because those are the ones that you've heard of. If you have a setting where the research question that you have doesn't lend itself to one of those, there might be a design out there that might help you a bit better. Thank you. Thank you.